Hey everyone, welcome to Faith Feed Living, where we learn how to study the Bible together. Do you know what you believe as a Christian? I mean, those core beliefs that identify us as a follower of Christ. Now, as believers, it's important to know what you believe, and thankfully God has given us His Word that we may know Him and what His Word says. But many times we as believers, we don't know those core beliefs, and that should not be the case if we claim to be followers of Christ. So unpacking the fundamentals and exploring the essential beliefs of the Christian faith is something that every believer should do. In this video, I am grateful and excited to share with you a conversation that I had with Krista Montreger. We talk about the core beliefs of the Christian faith. So before we start my interview with Krista, let me tell you a little bit about Krista. Krista Bontrager is a fourth generation Bible teacher. She is an author, theologian, podcaster, former university professor, co-founder of the Center for Biblical Unity, and an advocate for the Christian faith. Krista's teaching reverberates with Christians from all walks of life. She has a unique ability to communicate the truth of scripture in an accessible and practical way. She's dedicated her life to helping others discover how to love God in spirit and in truth. Her extensive teaching ministry can be found on her website at theologymom.com. All right, here is my interview with Krista. So welcome to the show. I'm so glad to be here. Um, I'm glad that you're here to talk about four beliefs of the Christian faith to kind of give us a foundation of what we're supposed to believe and then how we can you know, go about learning more about it. But before we get started, could you um, tell us about how you came to faith as a believer in Christ? Sure. I grew up in Southern California and I was raised by my mother. I uh, didn't have too much interaction with my father growing up. And um, so my mother, it was just me and my mom. I'm an only child. I do have two half siblings, but I was not raised with them. Um, but they're, they're in my life and I, I love them and we're close and everything. But um, our father had three children with three different women. So uh, we were all raised by our mothers. Um, and. Uh, I had a very strong church upbringing. My mother uh, took me to church. She was a pastor's kid. My grandparents lived near us. My mother made a very strong priority of having um, my extended family involved in my life. So my grandparents were a huge part of my life. Um, my uncles and aunts and cousins were a huge part of life, my life, even though we didn't have a lot of money. When I was growing up, my mother saved up all year so that we could buy two plane tickets to go to Missouri or go to Minnesota every summer. So I had time to know my cousins and be with my cousins. And I think that all of those efforts that she put into adding stability to my life, even though I was growing up in a single parent context, really helped provide a lot of stability. I had a very strong youth group experience. Um, I had a very unique youth pastor. And all of those factors really helped to keep me on an, on on the you know the good road. I, I think that not growing up with a father, there were challenges in that. But my mother did a good job of, you know, um, helping me navigate all of those things in spite of the challenges. So, yeah, I had a very strong Christian upbringing. And when I was 15, I was a freshman in high school. Um, my mother worked two jobs so I, I could go to a Christian high school. And um, I really, I think when I was 15, it really understood Jesus's love for me for the first time. Um, even though I'd grown up in the church and always heard the gospel, it was just kind of that aha moment of this is for me, uh, you know, kind of a thing. And so that, um, 
was really a turning point for me when I would say like, you know, a day and a time of when I got saved, if you will. But that's not to say that I wasn't already in a Christian context and there was really no time. I didn't know the Lord in some sense. Um, and I went to Biola university, uh, for my, um, university studies. I was a film and television major there. And that's where I met my husband. We were in the same major together. And that was just another season of my spiritual life, spiritual growth in college, learning more uh, about the Lord. Biola requires you to take 30 units of Bible as part of your program. And so my senior year, I took a theology class from a very uh, different kind of theology professor. He just taught theology very differently than I had ever heard before. And it really got my attention. And so I continued on into graduate school, started seminary right away after I had graduated from Biola and was in seminary for about six or seven years and did two master's degrees at Talbot School of Theology. And all of those things, all of those steps were all part of my spiritual growth. Um, learning theology for me, it was a big part of my spiritual formation. And so it's kind of all of those things together, if you will. Yeah. I, I love how your mother was intentional in um, bringing you up in those, you know, in the Lord and making sure that you knew, you know, about him, even though yeah. you have to choose for yourself. but. I yeah. love that did that for you. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So let's kind of move into our topic. Talking sure. about what are the core or central beliefs of the Christian faith. So kind of tell us about what, what are those. Yeah, that's a great question. And we'll kind of work our way through it. Um, I think we have a tendency <laughs> as American Christians to Think about our faith in very minimalistic ways. We have a tendency to think about it as like, okay, what's the bare minimum I have to do? Anyone who's been a parent of teenagers or been a teenager uh, right. can remember, you know, asking your parents like, well, what's the bare minimum I have to do in order to do X, Y, Z thing? This is just a feature, I think, of American thinking of, you know, what is the bare minimum in order to qualify for this? I tend to view things in a little bit more of a, a, a holistic or broad manner rather than starting with the bare minimum. And people, I, I want to say up front, different theologians answer this question differently. Mm -hmm. I'm going to give you my answer and how I've worked it out and taught about it over the years. So how Christians have historically thought about their faith of what are the minimum beliefs that you need is through um, a creedal statement called the Nicene Creed. Now, some people might not have heard of this before. They might have heard of the Apostles' Creed. If they grew up Catholic, they might have gone through a Catholic catechism class and even memorized the Apostles' Creed. Um, the Nicene Creed came along a little bit after the Apostles' Creed, a little bit more developed. But it is the, a, and a creed is just a statement of faith. It's a summary of our faith. And there are creeds in the Bible. When we think about Deuteronomy chapter 6, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. That's a creedal statement. Philippians chapter 2, um, starting in around verse 5 and following, where it talks about Jesus. There's a, there's a poem there that Paul, the Apostle Paul includes, that was likely an early creedal statement. It's a summary of our faith. So there's nothing mysterious about creeds. They're just handy ways of summarizing an issue. Um, so the Nicene Creed came about in the late 300s. It's fairly early in the church's history. And this is the one statement that all Christians agree on. Whether you're a Catholic or a Protestant 
or Eastern Orthodox, whether you're a, a Presbyterian, a Charismatic, or a Baptist. We all agree on the Nicene Creed. And so when I teach theology, this is where I start students, is grounding them in the Nicene Creed. So some of the things that are contained in the Nicene Creed are statements about who the Creator is. I believe in God the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. So this tells us something about the origin of the universe. It tells us something about the origin of ourselves. There's a section in the middle where it talks about who Jesus is. He was born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. And on the third day, he rose again. And he will come again to judge the living and the dead. So when we think about something like the Nicene Creed, this is how Christians have historically summarized what it means to be a Christian. I see Christianity as a worldview. It is a lens. It is a way of seeing the world. So I do not approach this question as, you know, this minimalistic, well, as long as you've asked Jesus into your heart, you're mm-hmm. good. Like that is not how Christians have historically thought about this issue. So I always like to start with the Nicene Creed. Now, here's the thing about the Nicene Creed, though, is that it doesn't say anything about scripture or the authority of scripture or what books ought to be in the Bible. It doesn't have anything to say about gender or marriage, which are big issues for us right now that we are wrestling with. So what I'd like to do with students as well is point them also to modern creeds where conservative Bible-believing scholars have gotten together, much like the Council of Nicaea in the 300s, and looked at scripture and put together a statement that summarizes the historic Christian position on things. So something I find helpful is like the Nashville Statement. If people want to look that up on Google, they can look up the Nashville Statement. It's a more recent statement of faith of what Christians have historically believed about gender and marriage. It's a very helpful summary. I think this is vital for us today. Now, must you have this in order to be saved? That's a different question. Someone might come into the faith And come from a very progressive background. Sanctification takes time. It takes time for us to understand the the height and the breadth and the depth of our faith. Mm -hmm. So someone might have very progressive theology at their salvation. But then as they learn and they grow in a more excellent understanding of the scriptures, hopefully Mm -hmm. they have people to disciple them. They ought to come into an understanding of something approximating the Nashville statement when you know they're they're thinking about issues like gender and marriage. The Chicago statement on inerrancy is another very helpful statement that outlines what Christians have historically believed about the Bible. And that was a council in the late 1970s, early 1980s, uh, kind of a modern council of Protestant scholars from across denominational lines that came together to discuss the doctrine of the Bible. So this is kind of what, for me, makes up the core of the Christian worldview. These are the things that when we're talking about what are the the things that we Christians really need to believe, I think that these are helpful statements that consist of the web of beliefs that Christians ought to hold. Does, does that help? You can feel free to ask a, a, any follow-ups. Yeah. I guess it comes to moving along, talking about, you know, doctrine, like what is doctrine and how does Christian doctrine, does how does it relate to like the core um, beliefs of the Christian faith? Or is yeah. it the, the same thing? Yeah, so doctrine is, and theology, I kind of use those inter, those terms interchangeably. Um, theology is just, is from the Greek word, um, it is theos, which means God, 
and logos, which means knowledge or word. And so when we think about theology, we are thinking about thoughts about God and who he is. And so in this sense, I say, like um, Dr. R.C. Sproul, who is a very well-known and popular um, theologian, that all Christians are theologians. All Christians have thoughts about God. What's interesting to me is that even non-Christians, to some degree, are also theologians. They also have thoughts about God or his non-existence or what he can and cannot do. These are all theological kinds of statements. Doctrine is is just more a of you know the specific classical categories of how we organize our theology we might organize it according to the doctrine of god sometimes this is called theology proper and so we put together all of the things that christians have historically believed about who god is his names his decrees his um his existence, his character, all of these things. Um, we might have the doctrine of the church. Sometimes this is called ecclesiology from the Latin. And um, it's, or from Greek, I'm sorry, that it's from the Greek word ecclesia, which is the Greek word for church. So our doctrine of church is everything the scripture teaches about the church. We might have the doctrine of salvation. Mm -hmm. This is everything the Bible teaches about salvation. So doctrines are, if you were to pick up what's called a systematic theology textbook, like um, by Millard Erickson or Wayne Grudem, those are two very common ones used in, in evangelical seminaries. Um, you would see that they're organized according to various doctrines. Doctrine oh. of God, doctrine of the church, doctrine of the Holy Spirit, doctrine of salvation, and so on. Mm -hmm. Okay, I see. And so you are also, you kind of intersperse theology in in there as, as far as, you know, everybody being a the theologian. So just to kind of recap a little bit, when you said sure. everybody's a theologian, this is how we study and learn our core beliefs as believers is that yeah that yeah and and maybe we could talk about why that's important you know why is it important for us to to study theology which is in my opinion this is an opinion but yes. and working in in as a professional theologian for the last 25 to 30 years um i think that I would, I, if Krista ruled the world, <laughs> every church would have classes in theology. Because, oh, yeah. um, this is really just teaching us what we believe. Um, and again, this is where our, our minimalist approach sometimes hinders us as American Christians. Is we think like, like well, I come on Sunday, I hear the sermons, you know, and that's enough. But there are so many things that, our pastor's sermons might not cover and we need more than just going to kind of a biblically based Ted talk in right. on Sunday to, to know really what the core of the faith is. And I cannot tell you how often when I teach theology classes and I do offer online theology classes for for regular what I call I call it theology for regular people these are the the things that I learned in seminary that I've kind of translated down for the person in the pew and invariably when people take my classes the number one piece of feedback I get is why I has never no one ever taught me this I've yeah. grown up in the church I've been in the church my whole life I've never learned about you know, the impassibility of God or why that's important or, you know, the hypostatic union of Christ, that he's fully God and, and fully human. These are things that are basic and foundational to our faith 
and yet they are not taught in many of our churches. So why this matters is, let's say, you know, you're dating someone, or for those of listeners who are married, it's really hard to take you seriously if you say, I love my husband, or I love my boyfriend or girlfriend, but you don't know anything about them. You don't know their birthday. You don't know their favorite color. You don't know um, whether they like cats or dogs or both. You don't know their favorite food. These are things that when we know about the person, it sends a signal of you know, that we care about them. Right. And when we come into a relationship, or as Jesus says, a friendship with the creator of the universe, we want to know him. We want to know some things about him. And that for me is really why learning theology is so important. Yeah, I, I wish we had more of that in our churches too. Yeah. You know, knowing what we believe and, and why and, you know, have that confidence. Because if yeah. you, you study something, you know, you have to take time to mull over it and learn it. And as versus like you said in a Sunday sermon, you hear it, but you know, there's different types of learning. So you exactly our story is not always the best for a lot of people. So yeah. you hear it and you don't remember it. So yeah. I think I think that would be great. So all right, and then kind of diving a little bit more it's not deeper but more detail as far as like denominations how are yes. denomination well what is a denomination and tell us kind of like a broad overview of how de denominated denominations are organized of course i know there yeah. the different denominations are organized differently or developed differently but just kind of yeah. give an overview yeah and uh happy to do that and i just want to let people know if they want the longer answer i have a teaching on my channel at Theology Mom on YouTube, where I do like a one hour presentation on denominations and, okay. and all of that issue. So I'm just going to give kind of a little thumbnail here. I'll put but, a link in the description. Yeah, that would be, that'd be great. And yeah. um, so when we think about this, what we, what we first, I'm going to answer this question from a historical standpoint, because I think that's the most helpful. Um, for the first thousand years or so of the church, the church was informally divided east and west. There were five major centers in the ancient church, uh, Constantinople, Jerusalem, Antioch, Alexandria, and Rome. And these five major centers of our faith were kind of the the leaders and we see this even emerging in the book of acts um constantinople withstanding but these were the the places of of real influence in the, in the early church now the only one of those cities that was in the west was rome all of the rest were in the east the theology for the most part of East and West was the same. But over time, Rome began to, and this is very political, okay, but there was a division between Rome and the other four cities. And eventually what happens, there's multiple situations that go into this, but eventually what happens is Rome breaks away from the East. And this is where we get the idea of the Pope and Roman Catholicism. So that's really the first major break in the church. There had been what were called schisms before, regional disputes. But overall, the church was still one. When Rome and, and the East separated, this is the first big break. And so we have Roman Catholicism and Eastern Orthodoxy. Okay. Now there is a small subunit under Eastern Orthodoxy called Oriental Orthodoxy, which I'm not going to go into, but it's still under the umbrella of the East. These are my friends 
who are the Coptic Christians and the Ethiopian Christians, but we're just going to set that aside for, for now, and we're just going to call it Eastern Orthodoxy, generally Pan-Orthodoxy, whatever you want to call it, and Roman Catholicism in the West. Fast forward about 500 years. Along comes a German monk named Martin Luther. Martin Luther was a man who was living, I believe, at the end of the 1400s, so in the 15th century, and he, it was a time of the beginning of the Renaissance, kind of a, a rebirth of interest in Greek and Roman sources. So there were a lot of things happening all at once. But Martin Luther has concerns over what he sees as excesses in the Roman Catholic Church. So he nails a call for debate on the door of a local church. And this was the standard practice back then. You want to have a debate, you nail this thing on the door, we're going to have this debate. So he wasn't doing anything peculiar or weird. Mm -hmm. It was never Martin Luther's desire to break away from the Roman Catholic Church in the beginning. He wanted to reform the Roman Catholic Church. He was not trying to go off and do his own thing. But eventually, the Roman Catholic Church kicked him out. And so he ended up doing his own thing. And this is where we get Lutheranism has a very unfortunate title of being named after Martin Luther. So it sounds like it's just about a man, but it was really about the fountainhead of what started what we call Protestantism. Protestants, and I love Protestantism because the word protest is right in our name. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, we were a break off of Roman Catholicism. So meanwhile, in the East, they're they're just living their life, they're doing their own thing. But out here in the West, we had Catholicism, then we had Lutheranism, which broke off of, off of Catholicism. From there, we start getting more and more splinter groups, and this is where we get denominations. So it's largely organized around country of origin, and this mm -hmm. is what most people don't understand. So Lutherans are primarily German Christians. It is the dominant form of Protestantism in Germany and Denmark and Scandinavia. Okay. Mm. Catholicism remained strong in France and Belgium. Those countries predominantly stayed Catholic as well as Italy because of Rome being there. Yeah. Eventually in the second generation of Protestantism there were more breakoffs and these became what I call doctrinal disputes. And some of them looking back seem very minor. <laughs> Um, of, of what the original issue was of why they, they split off. But Presbyterians are Scottish Protestants. They come from Scotland. Anglicans are British Protestants. Um, and let me give another example. The Reformed tend mm -hmm. to be Dutch Protestants. So that was what my family was from. My great-grandfather was a minister in Holland in the Dutch Reformed Church. And then um, immigrants started coming to America. Well, what did they bring with them? They brought with them their particular form of Protestantism to the new world. So the Scottish immigrants brought Presbyterianism. The Anglican or British Protestants brought Anglicanism, which is in the American version is called Episcopalianism. Um, the Reformed, the Dutch, brought refor the, the Reformed 
version of Protestantism to America. So when you drive down the street and you see these different churches, many of them have these names because of the old country, as my grandfather used to call it, the old country connections of Protestant Europe. Okay. Now, again, in Africa and in the East, they're just doing their Eastern Orthodox thing. They're, they're, they're not part of Protestantism. So if you live near a Greek Orthodox church or a Coptic church, Ethiopian Orthodox church, that's over here in the East. Okay. Well, more splintering happens. Then we have the Methodists. The Methodists come along another hundred years later. They're a splint off, a splinter group off of the Anglicans. They come out of Britain. Mm -hmm. The Methodist ministers come to America and they are called circuit riders. And they were vigorous church planters. And this is why we see so many Methodist churches in the South in particular, is that they, they were really instrumental in helping to settle America and they would um, plant churches. Um, let me give one more is the Baptists. Baptists um, technically started in England, but they have really flourished in America. They're almost <laughs> as close as you can get to being a, 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 a an American denomination. Mm -hmm. And there are thousands, apparently, <laughs> versions of Baptists. Because if there's one thing a Protestant likes to do, it's protest. And so we go off and we do our own thing. So when we think about denominations, yes, there are shades of differences between these groups. But there's also the historical origins that were part of it that is what brought, and, and then they brought that with them to America. And so now we're in this kind of melting pot where right. no longer do you even think about Presbyterians as being Scottish per se. Um, you go join a Presbyterian church because you align with their doctrine right. or a, a Baptist church because you align with their doctrine. We're not as concerned with the um, ethnic background of the denomination here in America, much like everything else was just a big melting pot and um, people shuffle around. So the final group is charismatics. Charismatics don't come around. So here we're talking about assembly of God and four square and, um, Pentecostal. Pentecostal. Thank you. Yeah. Those don't come <laughs> around until the, the 20th century and the Azusa street revival in the early decades of the 20th century. So charismatics are really the Johnny come lately's of the denominational divide. But so if you think of it as a tree, the, the, the kind of the stump and the root of it is, yeah. you know, the, the trunk is that first thousand years. Then we start breaking off Catholics and Orthodox. And then by the time we get to the branches at the top, you know, we got, we got thousands of denominations. So it seems like the, the Catholic and Protestant branched off a lot, but the Eastern Orthodox, they kind of just stayed like their own. Pretty much. Yeah. 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 So um, people can go on my channel and um, I did an interview recently with my very good friend who converted to cop being Coptic Orthodox. And they can, if they're curious to know more about the Orthodox perspective, um, they can check that out. But yeah, they were just kind of doing their own thing and they haven't really changed all that much. There's been some changes, but they, as my friend who's Orthodox says, um, we change very slowly for us. We're still acting like it's, we're in the year 400. Like it's, it's just that they, they don't do anything quickly. They, they're unconcerned about, you know, the modern conventions and that sort of thing. Oh, wow. Well, I, I love the way you explain that. I didn't. When you look at it at the different regions of the world, it kind of makes more sense now and how it kind of branched out. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I, this is why I think that there's so many, um, so much movement to in America to rise 
and reorganize around non-denominational things is because there is a sense in which you know a lot of this stuff is a little bit connected to the old world and the non-denominational people churches will just try to focus on the essentials things like the Nicene Creed as an organizing principle and so what we're starting to see now is less and less division over minor denominational differences and more uniting around the core essentials and that's the idea of the non-denominational church mm-hmm. and within the denominational church do they kind of like have a governing body for them or yes yeah, so that's a very interesting question so the episcopalians or anglicans depending on if you live in america or in great britain um and really the conservative anglicans now are uh, the the ones who live in the global south. It's really the Africans and um, the Chinese and the the Indians who are um, preserving the apostolic faith for the Anglicans. The Church of England and the Episcopalian Church in America have become so progressive and so liberal that the the future really is the global south. Um, I did a, a podcast about that last year, a fascinating discussion of the, it's called the rise of the global South. And I think the future will be um, as the American churches become more progressive. I actually think that uh, the African churches, the um, churches in China and Asia will become instrumental in preserving the apostolic faith. Um, I think that they are on the rise. And now I can't remember your original question because I got off on a tangent there. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, um, so governing bodies for oh, the, yes, bodies. the so, yes. nomination. The Episcopalians, the Anglicans, and the Catholics, and to some degree the, the, the um, Eastern Orthodox kind of function on a model of it's a very hierarchical model where um there's almost like this top down type of leadership and you know in the case of the catholics there's you know a pope at the top and then there's the college of cardinals and then it filters down to the local level of of the priest with the bishop being over multiple parishes uh, and that's similar in the Anglican tradition, although they don't have a pope, they informally have a head, which is the Archbishop of Canterbury. But mm-hmm. that is also changing as the church in England has become increasingly apostate. Uh, the churches in the global south really no longer acknowledge the Archbishop of Canterbury as their head. But there is sort of still this hierarchical idea of the bishop over multiple parishes and then the priests and the deacons at the local parishes. So those denominations tend to be much more structured and hierarchical. Presbyterians, Reformed, Lutherans, they tend to be more elder-led and the pastor is is a teaching pastor among equals. He's an elder among equals. So um, that tends to be their governance system. Baptists and non-denominational churches, charismatic churches, tend to use what I call more like the senior pastor model, where there is the, the senior pastor is kind of the lead, and you might have an elder or deacon team, but they have varying levels of authority in actually managing the church. It's mm-hmm. the the real focus in the church is on the lead pastor or the or the senior pastor. Okay. So what about like the Southern Baptist, like Southern Baptist Convention? Is that how is that kind of? I know. Yeah. How are they organized? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. So. The Southern Baptist Convention is interesting because technically 
they're not a denomination. They are an affiliation. Uh So their churches are all technically independent, but then they collaborate financially on things like curriculum. So Lifeway, people might have heard of Lifeway Publishing. Uh That's run by the Southern Baptists. So an individual church would contribute a certain portion of its budget to go to Lifeway to produce curriculum. Uh Um, they have their own seminaries. Um, they have, uh, a mission board. They have an international mission board and a North American mission board. They also have, um, the, the, they have like, um, like a think tank on religious liberty is the ERLC. So individual churches send money to the to the SBC and the, I think it's called I'm not Southern Baptist so uh, this is just based on research <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they, they um they contribute like to collaborate I think is what they call it so it's collaborative money and then that money gets pooled into these official Southern Baptist entities and so when the convention meets every year that each of those ent- entities gives reports to um, the representatives from the churches. They're called messengers who come to the convention because they ha- they're responsible to report on how that money is being used. And um, so technically, every Southern Baptist church is independent, though. The, the, the Southern Baptist convention does not control the churches now they can throw them out from what i understand they have to adhere to their their statement of faith it's called the baptist faith and message if a church begins to drift outside of the baptist faith and message i do believe the sbc can vote that church out which is what saddleback has been going through uh which is rick warren's church that he planted 40 years ago um, there's a lot of controversy right now about whether or not that church will be able to be readmitted into the SBC and all of that. So that's my understanding of how, how that operates. Okay. All right. So um, going back to our core beliefs and things like that, sure. what would be like some resources that you could recommend for people to you know study and learn more about um, the core beliefs of the faith? Yeah. So, um, for somebody who's kind of starting at the beginning, I I would recommend a book by my friend, Ken Samples. He is a theologian. He's one of my mentors. He has a wonderful little book called Without a Doubt, answering the uh, 20 tough faith questions or something to that effect. But it is a wonderful introductory primer to the Christian worldview. And he goes over, I think, many of the core essential doctrines. So if you don't want to make a big commitment to reading Wayne Grudem's Systematic Theology, you're not quite at that level yet. Uh, Ken Sample's book, Without a Doubt, is a wonderful um, start. And it's one of the books in my top five books that I think all Christians should read. Um, It's a very helpful book. and. And then if you want to go to the next level, um, you know, I might suggest taking a class. I offer um, theology classes through my website. Um, you, people can go to the Center for Biblical Unity.com or theologymom.com. And I have classes, live classes and on demand uh, mm-hmm. that I teach year round in various issues related to theology and theology for regular people. We meet on Zoom. And it's a wonderful way to get some guidance on how to learn theology. Um, If you want to, if you're, if people are, you know, um, really ambitious, they can get a hold of Wayne Grudem's Systematic Theology. Uh, He has the full version, which I call the big book. 
It's about <laughs> three inch spine, <laughs> but then there's an abridged version. It's called Biblical right. Doctrine that people can get. And he just updated that last year. But another very good one um, that I think I'm going to use next time I teach through the theology sequence is um, Millard Erickson's Systematic Theology. That's the one that I used when I was in seminary. Again, there's a big version, there's the thick one, mm -hmm. and there's an abbreviated one. And um, both of them are very fine. Uh, Millard Erickson, you're going to get kind of the standard Baptist theology. Uh, Wayne Grudem, you're going to get an eclectic mixture of reformed theology. So he's a Calvinist, um, but he's also believes in the continuation of the supernatural spiritual gifts. So it's he's kind of a an unusual uh. person in that he he almost seems like part reformed and part charismatic. Uh, but it's a very great textbook and it is used in many seminaries. It's, it's very helpful. So those would be some, some ideas, uh, for further study. Okay. Those are great. And I'll put a list of those in the link in the description also. So great. for our last question would be, could you tell us a Bible study tip that will be helpful in studying the Bible? Oh, that's my favorite thing. I have a whole class on how to how to interpret the Bible. I love to teach that. Um, I think a tip that probably no one else has given, I tried to pick something that was a little bit unusual, and that is to read the Bible out loud multiple times when you're studying the Bible. You want to look for, and I'm sure other people have shared a tip about reading things in context. You know, you want to get the big chunk. What I like to have my students do when we uh, learn how to study the Bible is we read, you know, if I'm teaching through the book of Ephesians in a class, we're going to read through the book of Ephesians four, five, six times. And I always encourage my students to read it out loud and to do it, if you can, in one sitting. If you can't do it in one sitting, do it in two. Um, but that's how the Bible was intended to be read. We have a tendency as Americans to read it silently in our heads, but the Bible was, was written to, to be declared. And there are many verses to this effect in scripture. In fact, one of the instructions the apostle Paul gives to Timothy is not to neglect the public reading of the scriptures. And so in the Jewish tradition, um, you know, they would read the, the book of Esther you know, once a year and, and, and they read it out loud when they go to the synagogue. Um, my friend who is Coptic, they read the book, the entire book of Revelation, uh, one night a year. Um, and I can't remember if it's Easter Saturday. I could be wrong about that, but there's one holiday a year where they read through the entire book of Revelation. I mean, and so the Bible in ancient times was intended to be read aloud. And every time I have my students read read the Bible aloud, they always come back and say, I never noticed this little detail because I was reading it in my head and I do it a lot faster and I missed these details. So read in large chunks. If you can read the whole book, but definitely read it aloud. You will be blessed. Yeah, that is that that could be that is true because when you're reading you have aloud you have to pronounce each word so you're kind of focused on each word for just a, maybe it's just a second or so so yeah that is yeah tip. yeah all right well Krista thank you for being on the show and sharing with us your wisdom about theology and Christian beliefs oh it's my pleasure thanks for having me. So I hope this video was helpful in unpacking the core beliefs of the Christian faith. But don't, let's, but don't let this be a stopping point for you. I will put in the description the resources that Krista mentioned in the show. So please go check out her website, Theology Mom, for the various courses he teaches on theology. Thanks for watching. <laughs>